Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly Father. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Some great words from the Lord Jesus Christ. That said, Darren, what do you admire or even love about Governor J.B. Pritzker? (laughs) Darren Bailey was the Republican nominee for the 2022 race for Illinois governor. He ran a hard-fought race against incumbent Governor J.B. Pritzker, but ultimately did not win. However, he certainly won the hearts and minds of nearly half of Illinoisans who also hold conservative values. Darren was born and raised in Louisville and is a proud third-generation farmer. Today, Darren and his sons own and operate Bailey Family Farm, growing corn, wheat, and soybeans. In addition to farming, however, Darren and his wife Cindy founded Full Armor Christian Academy, a preschool through grade 12 school in 2016. And in 2018, Darren was elected to the Illinois House of Representatives for the 109th District and then later elected to represent the 55th District in the Illinois State Senate. In today's conversation, you will hear Darren and I discuss a number of important issues from his thoughts on the recent gubernatorial race to his relationship with former President Donald J. Trump to his thoughts on election integrity, abortion, energy, God, and the Safety Act, and also what he loves about Governor J.B. Pritzker, all this and much more more. I will do my best to ask good, tough, and thought-provoking questions to Darren that both Republicans and Democrats will appreciate. Before we begin, if you'd like to support this show and assist in landing other great guests, such as Governor J.B. Pritzker, which will be an incredible and good-hearted conversation if it happens, be sure to subscribe to The Paul Garcia Show on YouTube, follow it on Facebook, and like this video, leave a comment on it, and share it. This tells YouTube and Facebook to show the episode to more people, while also showing big-name guests like Darren and J.B. that it's a show worth coming on to. Also be sure to check out the sponsors whose ads will play around the middle of this episode. And now, my conversation with Mr. Darren Bailey. It's been about a month and a half since the race for Illinois governor ended. What have you been up to since then? Well, certainly a, a, a little uh, less of an egregious schedule. I've been catching up with family, been uh, having a grandchildren uh, uh, come and stay with us. The uh, Within days after the uh, election, uh, Cindy and I took off a few days and went to Franklin, Tennessee. And we can't stay at any of these places too long, or it's tempting to want to stay, but to listen to some speakers that have uh, encouraged us in the past. And, and it was pretty amazing because while we were there uh, walking down the street, of Franklin, I bet uh, no less than a dozen people came up to us, recognized us. Half of those people were looking for homes in Tennessee. And then we were invited to uh, Mar-a-Lago with the Moms for America. So we took off to uh, uh, Florida, spent a few days there, came back, met some friends and in, in, again in central Florida and again made a pit stop in Tennessee. So uh, those are uh, some getaways that uh, we've been taking care of grandkids. And then we've been stoking the flames. Uh, we just got back uh, from uh, Yorkville, Naperville. Chicago, meeting with friends that are truly interested in uh, restoring Illinois, as I know most of your crowd is. The dream, uh, the possibility is not dead. We must learn from our mistakes as a farmer. I know that all too well, and uh, we can look at some of the problems and issues that were ignored, and uh, and we can work on that. But there is a lot of work to do in Illinois, and, and Cindy and I are not giving up. Despite the race being over, it's very obvious that you still care so much about the state of Illinois. It sounds like you're just getting started with something here, but I'm curious. You mentioned that you went to Tennessee to listen to some people talk. What kind of people, who do you look up to and who do you listen to? Well, I'm glad you, uh, uh, most books that I read are from, uh, you know, are biblical based uh, 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 Christian uh, spiritual leaders. Uh, so so this particular uh, 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 venue was a Dutch Sheets. Um, every morning, uh, he does a, a video podcast, Give Him 15. Uh, he uh, uh, he has prayed over the nation for years. He's prayed over and anointed us. Uh, interestingly enough, in 2000, he and some other pastors traveled to every capital, every capital in the nation. And when they visited Illinois, they declared it as uh, as you know the change state, ready to uh, ready to bring change. So um, 
we went there. Uh, we were recognized. We were brought up on stage and, and got to speak for a little bit, and it was pretty amazing. So, you know, I, I believe, even though we're not acting like it, I believe that uh, the United States of America is still a Christian nation. Uh, and the reason, biggest reason I know that is because all I have to do is read the Constitution, and, and I see that all throughout. And and uh, we've just uh, we've got to have people to, to stand up, to sound the alarm, to stand on God's Word, and restore us back to our intent. And if we continue to go the direction that we are, are going, we are going to miss, we are going to lose God's blessing, and uh, this great country will be no more in time if we don't put a stop to what's taking place. Right. It's not like you can remove one of the biggest components to the foundation of the country and expect nothing to happen. That component being faith in Christianity specifically. On the topic of faith, though, you're not shy about it. You and your wife, Cindy, live the motto of faith, family, and farming. You've more or less mentioned all three of these things already in just a few minutes. In 2016, along with running the family farm, you founded, with your wife Cindy, Full Armor Christian Academy, which is a preschool through grade 12 school that gives parents the option of a Christ-centered education for their children. Just how important is your faith to you, and why did you decide to start this massive project in a school? Well, my faith is everything to me. It's what guides every decision. Uh, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've studied through God's Word. I've, I've been a Christian all of my life. I've grown up in the church, and sometimes in this, uh, sometimes today, we think that's good enough. It's kind of like a job. You go, you clock in, and you go home. Hey, I went to church. I did my thing, and and uh, you know, gave a few prayers through the week. But it's not. It's not enough. God must come first in everything. And about twenty years ago, I started the. Practice. I wished I would have done it, and, and you know, much earlier in my life, it would have been very beneficial to me. Would have been very beneficial to our marriage early on, and and averted a lot of the fights and the arguments and the misunderstandings that uh, you know we we have sometimes. But about twenty years ago, I. Uh, I got involved in, in just getting up early in the morning, giving God the first part of my day and reading, just spending the first half hour, 30 minutes of praying, reading his word and, and, and studying and just waiting and listening. And that was radical. That, uh, that, that changed uh, my life. So uh, since then... Uh, everything that I've done, my farming habits, my work habits, my you know that my relational habits, the habits of loving others, uh, man, it's all changed because God, uh, God's word must come first in absolutely everything. And unfortunately, that aspect is being left out because people think they're too busy. And, and they, you know, we're being overburdened by government with, with taxes and higher costs and, and uh, just, just more regulations. And it, and it takes us away from family. It takes us away from what life should be, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We're struggling. We're drowning in, in a bunch of nonsense imposed upon us by our state and federal government. So when that happens, uh, we, we become focused on on you know the issues of just living getting by paying bills and, and we kind of push God out of the way and when that happens uh, essentially all hell breaks loose and that's what's happening in this state in this nation right now mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you're a very devout Christian man uh, a couple questions first I'm just gonna ask you a quick one what denomination are you if you are one so I uh, I grew so, and that's been the beauty of uh, these last two years. Uh, Cindy and I have been to my actual home church uh, twice in two years because every Sunday we're in a different church somewhere in the state, and we can, we're continuing that practice. We're being invited. I grew up all of my life in the non-denominational Christian church, and um, I was uh, served from the early 2000s to 2014 as a, as a lead elder in the non-denominational uh, Christian church, and. Uh, a lot of people here in the Bloomington area, maybe like Lincoln Christian College, St. Louis Christian College, uh, those are uh, those are from our, uh, you know, we're not really a denomination. But in uh, 2015, uh, I experienced a healing of our oldest grandchild, and some things happened. It radically changed our life. Uh, people knew that uh, our granddaughter had been healed, and uh, some things that I thought I believed or was teaching, uh, the gifts of healing, uh, uh, so forth. 
uh, radically invaded our life. So uh, as we begin to spend the next few years searching uh, out God's word for what uh, we believed he was trying to tell us, uh, that moved us to the assembly. So right now today, uh, we are actual members of, of Cross Roots uh, Church in Effingham, which is a, an assembly's church. So that's where we belong. Uh, you know, this whole thing, I, I think everyone's on a journey. I think faith and, and, and the proclamation of believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and, and accepting him as your favorite, Savior, that is first and foremost. And from there on, it's just it's a, you know, a personal journey as to what we're ready for, where God places us and puts us. Uh, but I am uh, I'm proud to call the Assemblies my home right now. Beautiful, beautiful. Effingham, Illinois, that's home to one of the biggest crosses in the world. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, aside from it's a, it's a replica uh, from a, a cross in Tyler, Texas. So, mm. uh, yeah, we're, uh, I, I've did a, I, I do a lot of Facebook Lives there. You know, it's a, a lot of times when things get difficult, and especially if I'm on my way to Springfield or Cindy's with me or some early some morning I'm, I'm traveling to Effingham to get something. You know, we always, we always say, you know, when we have problems, go to the cross, and metaphorically, but that is – it is an amazing place just to go and honor and recognize, uh, you know, our, our Savior. Uh, yes, I, I, it is an, a, an awesome uh, place. Something I like to ask men who are devout like yourself is, has there ever been a time, you mentioned you've always been Christian, has there ever been a time that your faith has been significantly tested or lost altogether? So not to be arrogant, but no, I've always so I, I think one of the things that I think one of the reasons why I can say that is that I'm a farmer, and when you're a farmer, um, you know you ba- you are at the whim of the weather, you know the markets, the everything is really out of your control, and 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 the most obvious being the weather, which is you know controlled by God, and and there's there's been many times when there's been those years, and and, and every farmer experiences this. Is like, man, I, I need one more good year, and I can get on top, you know, and I can finally get over the edge and start trading equipment, and st- and you don't get it. As a matter of fact, uh, sometimes uh, you know, some, uh, sometimes a drought and a complete blowout is the best thing to happen uh, because then you you know you have you have insurance that kicks in, but many times uh, your yields fall right into the to the to the mid and there's really no assistance or help and and they're below the profit level so uh, so you get up you, you put your boots on and you go back to work and you just realize okay I, I'm this is what I have and what am I going to do with it so being a student of God's word being immersed in his word uh, I, I, I trust him so and I like I said I don't mean to sound arrogant but I cannot go back to a time in my life when I just yeah, have I have I questioned God yes have I been angry at God? Yes. You know, uh, have I been uh, frustrated and, and wondered why? Yes. Uh, have I did all three of those in the last month and a half? Yes. Uh, but still, at the end of the day, I trust him, and um, I'm just blessed that I was raised, uh, you know, in, in a home and uh, attended a church with, with a group of teachers and believers that, uh, you know, built this foundation that uh, regardless what happens, I will believe and I will be faithful. Beautifully put. I love that you said that have you gotten mad at God, questioned God, even maybe even the existence of God. I like that you said yes to all of them, but you always trust and you always believe in him because to live is to wrestle with God. Yes. That's what Israel means, to struggle or to wrestle. I like the wrestling version of it, but it means to struggle and wrestle with God. That's what the word Israel means, and that's what life is all about. You never know. It's not like he's right here reassuring you verbally, you have to trust. You have to have this blind faith kind of a thing. Anyway, all that said, you can't talk to Darren Bailey. When you think about Darren Bailey, you think about faith. It's just that Mm. simple. Wow, thank you. But do you think your faith, your proud faith even, that hurt you in your campaign? Or do you think it was a positive? (laughs) Oh, well, I think, um, you know, my obedience to my creator Uh, far outweighs everything else, and I would never surrender, and I would never change that. The reality is, uh, in Illinois, um, you know, the the, the polls that we've taken, Illinois is not a Christian state as a a whole. I mean, the majority of the people, uh, you know, fewer and fewer each year are are faithful in their endeavor and their their faith and then their belief. That is real. I I just got back from Chicago uh, today, and and a lady came up to me off the street. Cindy and I are walking on the street, you know, and people are coming up all the time 
time because they, you know, with all the uh, all the uh, terrible ads that were against me, people recognized me, and you know, and that's that's kind of a good thing because it opens up door for conversation. But that's what she said. She said, "I love you, and and I, and I wished I could have voted for you, but I couldn't mm. because you're just too far, you know, you're too far to the right." And then you know, faith was part of that. Other issues were part of that. And I just I will not surrender. I want to stand up and let God use me as an example, just to say, "Hey, faith, obedience." Once you give it a try, it can change your life. But yes, mm. uh, unfortunately, I will have to say that uh, that probably played a factor in it. And I was, you know, I was advised uh, to back off. You know, when you say a prayer, mm. don't pray in Jesus' name, you know, because you're offending people. And I'm, I'm like, <laughs> well, thank you. That's a compliment. So Wow. So you were advised, like, hey, maybe tone it down a little bit oh, with yes. the Jesus-y, Christian-y prayers and the, the proud... Um, display of faith, you were told to tone it down. You do believe that although you're proud of it, it probably lost you some votes. Yes, but not to the, I will never push my faith on anyone or anyone's faith. I am who I am. If you don't like it, you don't have to watch my messages on Facebook. If you don't like it, you don't have to vote for me. But I believe that I'm reasonable enough to sit and have a conversation and, and listen. I served on the school board for 17 years, you know, in our in our schools in Louisville and, and, and uh, you know, at, at the whole entire time that I was on the board, if you would have come and visited our schools, you would have thought you were at a Christian school because we just, you know, the, the atmosphere was awesome. The school board prayed, and 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 God came first in that place. So, that is that's always my message. Hey, I, there's something here, and and I have some access to it. And if you want it, I'll help you. But uh, at no point in time, and I don't even agree with that to push my belief on anyone or to force that in government. It's just simply who I am. And if I if I'm if that intrigues you, then uh, I ha- I'd love to share more with you. Right. And when you're running for office, you have to be your authentic self for fear of being someone you're not. People electing someone that you are not, you're lying to them at that point. So you're an honest man. That much is true. And on the topic of faith, you know, we're going to move on to more government stuff, but we have to talk about faith. It is integral to who you are. I have an interesting question for you. So Jesus Christ says in Matthew 5, 43, You have heard that it is said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly father. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Some great words from the Lord Jesus Christ. That said, Darren, what do you admire or even love about Governor J.B. Pritzker? <laughs> oh, I, I, the fact that I have to admire that he is a creation of, of uh, you know, my creator. Uh, God has a plan. God has a purpose for him. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he he has chosen, you know, to use his influence, his wealth, his his power, uh, to to I'm going to say destroy everything that I hold dear, and I do mean that. This man is destroying the state. So, so you know, there is such a thing as, as the righteous anger. There is such a thing as, you know, holding a brother accountable. Jesus teaches that. And, uh, you know, to, to, to stand here and, and uh, you know, there may be a, different as, as, a difference as far as, you know, I love you as a, I would do anything for you. I would do anything for J.B. Pritzker. You know, I would, I would help him if he were in need. But to have to like that and accept that, uh, I, I don't. I don't see that in the word. I, I, I see people needing, you know, the prophets of old who stood up and, and drew the line and said, "Enough! There is truth to something, and we must change course, or or we are going to be headed towards." judgment or destruction so uh and i i don't think i i, I held no punches uh with with jb pritzker in, in our debates and my facebook messaging and my messaging um uh, as far as he and i sitting here and and having anything in common aside of the air that we breathe uh i i don't see that in this man's ideology and his ideals and what he is supporting and what is he he is doing to our schools and our children and our veterans and on and on and on he is destroying the fabric of a constitutional republic that we hold dear right i hear you but certainly he's not the devil incarnate everyone has good and bad in them 
Is there anything that you can say, Darren Bailey, that you admire about J.B. Pritzker? Maybe it's his sense of style. Maybe it's something silly. But I want to hear you give a compliment to the man. Well, now I did do that. Did you, were you? Uh, did you watch the uh, debate where I was asked? I, it was right here in Bloomington, I believe. Uh, what uh, say something nice? And I did give a. I said you're. Uh, you look good in your suits. And maybe after this was over, you'll take me shopping. And as a, as a, as a matter of fact, uh, Politico, one of the political operative magazines, uh, yesterday gave their last issue before the end of the year. Year, and they had everybody's Christmas uh, wish list, and <laughs> there was Darren Bailey, and it said uh, Governor Pritzker's Taylor's cell number. So, uh, you know, and I don't mean to be, um, yeah, you know, when I've talked to the man uh, before he, uh, I was elected as a brand new state representative, and, and the morning of inauguration in 2019 in January, uh, there in, in Springfield at the Wyndham Hotel at the base of it, I'm up early, I'm up at six o'clock to when Starbucks open to run downstairs and get my wife a cup of coffee. And there's J.B. Pritzker setting, you know, newly elected governor. He would be, I think, inaugurated a few days earlier. And I, I just, uh, first time I met him and I went up to him, shook his hand, and, and he was very cordial. And I just said, sir, I hope that uh, we can get our state under control. And I told him about my children and my grandchildren. And, and he said, I agree. I hold all that stuff so dear. But evidently, I didn't do a good enough job explaining my concerns because we have had nothing, nothing in common since that time. Hmm. Looking back now at the governor race, what would you have done different if you had a do-over? If I – the one thing, and I don't think the people were ready for it, was uh, come down a little harsher on the Republican Party. The Republican really? Party in the state of Illinois is in shambles. We have a, we have a, a failed leadership. Uh, we have good leaders out there in some of the counties and some of the county chairs, but for the most part, it's the same thing that I dealt with in years sometimes in church leadership. Someone gets elected or, or, or with a title and they, they have their name badge on, and, and man, that authority uh, just throws things over the edge. But, uh, you know, early voting, mail-in voting, the fact that Republicans uh, simply, you know, with – with the uh, loss of uh, uh, Governor Rauner several years ago, money went out the door. Ken Griffin, you know, made a huge mistake in his journey. His money went to Florida. Uh, Mr. Uline's one of the last, uh, you know, bastions of of hope for us. And and who knows where he's going to be at. And it is all because um, uh, the leadership of the Republican Party has failed us for over 20 years. We've had the same people for all practical purposes in positions of authority and leadership. So uh, maybe after the primary. Area would have been more vocal. I, I mean, I've pushed back against the establishment from day one. I've been that person in caucus when, when my own colleagues were standing up and saying, "Yeah, I'll vote for that tax increase." I was the one that stood up and said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! Our, our, we're Republicans, and 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 our, uh, you know, our, what we believe in does not include." Uh, you know, tax increases. We're supposed to be for lesser government. We're supposed to be, we can figure, we're, you know, if we have less government, then we shouldn't need all these tax increases. Mm. So I've been that person. I've pushed back. And, I, you know, I don't know what that would have looked like. But in the days ahead, you're going to hear a lot more of that. I'm going to be holding people's feet to the fire. And I've, I have found out we can't, uh, you know, we can't fix this from the top down. We have got to fix this from the bottom up. And that means that, uh, you know, Cindy and I will be traveling the state encouraging people to run for precinct committee positions to fill all of these precincts in these county Republican groups and uh, p- to potentially oust uh, some of these failed leaders. I say some because they're not all that way. We've got some amazing people out there who are doing the right thing. But unfortunately, in Chicago and a lot of the higher populated areas, uh, we've got people hanging on to power. And I just I do not understand that. Mm-hmm. But it is destroying. Uh, it's, it's destroyed our party. And because of that, it is destroying our freedoms. In a Chicago Tribune article, you were quoted saying, Republicans need to be the loyal opposition in Springfield, loyal to our state, loyal to our country, and loyal to our Constitution, but an opposition to the radical policies of the Democrats. Bit of a softball question here, but what radical policies are you referring to? Well, abortion. Let's talk about life. Let's talk about the fact do that it. Uh, here in Illinois, we have full-term abortion. I was one of them that, uh, by the grace of God, in May of 2019, as a new state representative and sitting on the Human Services Committee, uh, that uh, full-term abortion bill dropped at, uh, at midnight on uh, Memorial Day weekend. And, uh, you know, that's as, as do all 
major bills. So, uh, you know, and now, now we, because of some of the compromise and the fact that Republicans haven't uh, uh, stood up and pushed back early on, we allowed a Republican governor just, uh, you know, eight months earlier than that to uh, to sign into law a taxpayer-funded abortion. Uh, so, so when we, uh, you know, when, when we destroy life and, uh, and allow it, and, and, and I say that because uh, all the Republicans that are currently elected and have been there for a while, that, yeah, they oppose abortion, but they have allowed it by some of their practices of compromise in terms of before. I look at our U.S. congressmen and women, and they go out to Washington and they, and they uh, you know, uh, support the budget. And, 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 I, and I question that a lot of times with people. Okay, you, you supported this budget, yet this budget has a half a billion dollars for Planned Parenthood. Mm-hmm. Where was your voice to stand up and say, pull that out or I'm not voting for it? Why do you think Republicans go along with this when they got into office saying that they wouldn't go for that <laughs> stuff and vote for that stuff? Why do you think – give me some real insight here. Why do they vote in favor of that budget that includes supporting heavily the very institutions that they swore – to do away with or vote against. Yeah, absolutely. And so the real, the, the, the real meat of that issue is uh, the voters have got to do a better job of vetting and getting to know the candidate, number one, as they're running, and number two, once they're elected, to stay right there with them to either encourage them or hold them accountable for bad actions. Many times we pat people on the back and we say, go get them, send them to Washington, send them to Springfield, you know, the county courthouse, the school board, and then we check out and we go back to work. We have got to stay involved. So the first day you show up, um, you're you're literally taught, these people are trying to tell you, okay, we've got to work together to compromise. That's how we get things done. You pat me on the shoulder, I'll pat you on the shoulder. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you, 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 you go get your office in Springfield and, and you're sitting there doing business and you have this continual rotation of people sliding into your door and they're called lobbyists. And many times these lobbyists come in and say, you know, I've... Um, uh, we need, to, we need to double the gas tax. And if we can double the gas tax, uh, we can fix all of our roads and make everything awesome. You know, I say that, and it's interesting because when I was in Tennessee and Georgia and Florida, uh, they have pretty amazing road systems, uh, yet their gas was a dollar cheaper than ours. So I want everybody to kind of consider that. But they, they sit down with you, whatever it is, what a tax increase, whatever it is that we need. And, you know, if you'd go along with this, uh, we can help you out. And then uh, you can go online to, to websites like IllinoisSunshine.org, and you can type in your, your, uh, your, your state legislator, and you can look at the donations they've received and see who they came from, and then you can start to piece and put together why they vote the way they do. It's a, it's a, it's a favor system, and when you get in there and you're all alone in your office and people are coming in to you, and uh, you don't have the crowd, you don't have your, your home folks with you, you know, to have in your back, and it becomes becomes very tough uh, to be who you say you were, and it becomes very easy. Nobody's around. Okay, yeah, sign me up for that. I, I, I'll vote for that. And that's why Republicans are failing, because this whole word compromise, being in the minority, thinking that we have to work along, get along, and, and support some of this nonsense so that we can get some of our ideas out. No. Draw the line and say, absolutely not. Let your voters know this is what these people are wanting me to do. I'm going to stand against it. And unfortunately, you don't see that happen very much with Republicans in Illinois. Hmm. Man, you're well spoken on this subject. It's been a long time since I've heard someone speak so eloquently about that. It's obvious that you really know your stuff. On the topic of being who you're supposed to be and being authentic, being honest, being true, being a a spokesperson of the people, J.P. Pritzker is a billionaire. His position of governor pays $177,412 in salary, although he declines to pay. My question to you is, why? what do you suppose his motives are for running for governor? It's a very difficult position to be in. What are his motives for that? And maybe first you can answer, would you take the salary of $177,000? Would you accept that? If you've been living with an aching back, debilitating imbalances, or any physical discomfort and just want to get back to living a fit and happy life, look no further than In Motion Fitness Center and Outpatient Therapy at Fairview Haven in Fairbury, Illinois. Our highly skilled therapy team will guide you through proven and effective exercises to help you regain your strength, movement, and mobility, all with our renowned level of love and care. Live your best life. Call our therapy team at 815-692-6724 to find out how we can serve you today. 
Choosing insurance can be complicated and daunting. That's why you need to call Pam Deaton with Health Markets. Pam will help you with all of your insurance needs, including health, life, vision, dental, and disability insurance. She's consistently been one of Health Markets' top national agents over the years and continues to earn great reviews from her clients. If you or a loved one needs to find the right insurance plan, you're in the right hands with Pam. Call her at 309-287-2518 to see how she can help you today. Fairbury Furniture in Fairbury, Illinois has added over 7,000 square feet to their showroom, and that means more selection for you. Why wait for your furniture? You can buy anything on the showroom floor and take it home today. So hop in the car and take the short drive to Fairbury Furniture, where customers love their selection, pricing, and their take-it-home-today power. So many Bloomington Normal residents have made Fairbury Furniture their favorite furniture store, just 26 minutes away in downtown Fairbury. Hurry down to Fairbury Furniture, where the furniture rocks. I love pizza, especially pizza from Marshalloni's Pizza in Fairbury, Illinois. Experience Marshalloni's Pizza and their famous cheese nuggets for an amazing price when you order today. If you call them up at 815-692-4602, between 4 and 5 p.m. and order a pizza, you will get the second pizza of equal or lesser value for free. Restrictions apply. You can even pick up that order after the 4 to 5 p.m. window and still get that happy hour discount. As a pizza connoisseur myself, I will proudly say that my favorite barbecue chicken pizza is from Marshalloni's. So check them out. 815-692-4602. Pick it up at 4 Four five East Locust Street in Fairbury. They're open seven days a week from four to nine p.m. Well, uh, if I would have been elected governor, I would have taken the salary because I would have needed to with our travel. And you know, I'm not uh, the self-made billionaire. Everything that I have is tied up in the farm, and that is a that is a working. You know, to have the all this cash available to you. I'm a, I'm a, for all practical purposes a second generation farmer, and I could argue that I'm a first generation farmer, uh, trying to get my kids, my sons, and my daughters, and my family up and going. So uh, I, I would have, you know, I, I would not have been able to donate the salary back and and although I commend him for that he's able to do that that is great uh, I have to consider the fact and and, and why he um does what he does, I can only assume. Uh, so, you know, I would have to, I find it very interesting that, you know, his net worth grew over $400 million over the last four years. You know, you had COVID, you had investment in pharmaceuticals. I mean, I'm sorry, but you can just walk right down the line, whether it's uh, latex gloves, whether it's masks, whether it's, and these are investments that supposedly, yeah, you, you can put all this together. Yes, if, if I would have been elected as governor, I would have had to have divested myself out of the farm. I could still be a silent partner but i you know have no decision making in the process you know obviously if i knew something was going to come down to benefit uh, planting corn you know i'm not supposed to be able to call my sons and said hey make sure you plant all corn next year so it's going to be good but these are smart people with a lot of money and, and he mm-hmm. has a lot of money invested you know both here and abroad uh, so uh, we, we see it happen all the time why so here's the other question why does somebody with uh, all this money and power and authority want to be uh, want to have this position as you know governor of the state right. of Illinois? I, I don't know, but unfortunately, we keep looking at that and, and with stars in our eyes, and we keep electing people like that, and they keep failing us because because they are not like us. Well, Darren, I have to say, you know, you, you say he failed us. I hear a lot, and I talk to people on the right and the left. I hear a lot about the governor's poor financial management from the right while simultaneously hearing about his financial excellence from the left. The governor has touted his fiscal management amid a pandemic environment. Those are his words. Leading to a, leading to six credit upgrades from S&P Global Ratings in contrast to the 20 years without a credit upgrade prior to his office. What letter grade would you give JB's financial management, or just what do you think about his financial management, and what do you make of the six credit upgrades? It sounds like he's doing yeah, a fantastic job. No, I've been very vocal about that, too, and I give him an F minus, if that's possible. <laughs> uh, because, uh, so, so entering COVID, without COVID, there would be a lot of things would be different without COVID. I don't know if I'd be uh, here, you know, running for governor. I sued JB Pritzker because of, of you know, you got to understand as a state representative, Uh, Once the shutdown started in April, uh, my office is inundated, and that's one of the things that elevated me to where I'm at, inundated by by business owners, uh, growing men and women all over the state of Illinois, calling my office, bawling, crying, needing help. Uh, They're trying to get a hold of their state representatives and senators, and granted, I'm not throwing everybody under the bus. There were a lot of people, but for the most part up north, the Democrat uh, uh, legislators, they closed their offices. They went home because the governor told them to go home. 
I staffed my offices with more people. People were coming because, you know, I've been told that I have to shut my hair salon or my business, but I've still got to pay the bills here, and I've got inventory that's going bad. What do I do? So uh, I and other state legislators went to work, and that's what inspired the lawsuit when I sued J.B. Pritzker. So, you know, that in and of itself, part of COVID, elevated the, the situation. Uh, through the year and a half of COVID, you had over two hundred billion dollars of federal money we, we call it free covid money no that's that's your money that's taxpayer <laughs> dollars that that do indeed have to be paid back in time two hundred billion dollars injected jb pritzker's first year's governor he was the first governor to borrow from the, he's the only governor in the nation to borrow seven and a half billion dollars from the federal reserve because of our problems so you and i if you know, we, we if we experience a year where we've lost money, the question is, can you or I go to the bank and borrow money and borrow $10 more than what we lost and say we made money? No, it's all got to be paid back. We still lost money, and now we've increased our liability. That is what is taking place with the state of Illinois. Uh, out of this $200 billion of money that was injected into the state, 20 of that, $20 billion was laid in his lap to, to, to pay off debt, to take care of things. And he expanded government through that. And as a matter of fact, the, the men and women out there who are making payroll right now, uh, they get it because the unemployment insurance trust fund, uh, is has, has he failed to pay it back in a timely manner. And right now, they're paying extra, almost double unemployment that they should be paying right here in Illinois. So no, all of this money was was it was you know because of COVID it was terribly mismanaged because now our liabilities are higher than they ever been through the through the campaign I talked about his failure to meet our pension obligations. You know what happened last week? He failed to make the four billion dollar annual pension payment again for the umpteenth time in, in in Illinois history. So we're right back to where we were, and 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 people. People are paying attention more to Fox News and national news, and they're not really seeing and grasping what's – because the state business is kind of boring. It's tedious. It's kind of ugly, and it never really seems to work right. So people, I think, are saying, well, this is crazy. It can't – but it is happening, and that's what's destroying the state of Illinois. Well, you're saying that, if I understand correctly, what looks like a great financial job that J.B. Pritzker's done is actually a facade. It's a bit of a misunderstanding. He's paying off things with money – that he is borrowing. It sounds like is that what you're saying? Well, and, borrowing plus what's been given to him. Imagine you know right. we we see these stories all the time of people that win lotteries but they don't know how to manage their money and and in a few years they've lost everything and now they're in debt and in worse shape than they, they were. You mark my words. In time, Illinois is going to find itself in that same shape. Our un, our uh, our our uh, work comp insurance. Is two and a half times higher than every state in the nation. Gas is a is a, is a, on average ninety two cents higher than any state around us. The only thing that's benefiting us, the only thing right now at this point in time, is our location. And in time, people are going to figure out. I'm just going to move a few miles over into Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, Iowa, Missouri, or Kentucky, and do business because it's easier, it's cheaper. And that the bottom line, when we keep raising taxes and regulations, and our and our cost of energy doubles like it's done, uh, people can't afford to be here. Mm -hmm. Right, right, man. So much to talk about. And for the sake of time, though, I do want to move on to a few other subjects. This one is particularly fiery, I would say. You spoke briefly of abortion. And abortion is one of the most controversial, most hot topics in Illinois and also the country. I'd like to ask you about something that got you in hot water. Now, you have said that the attempted, and you just correct me if I'm phrasing this wrong or anything, You've said that the attempted extermination of the Jews in World War II doesn't compare to the life that has been lost with abortion since its legalization. Six million Jews were brutally murdered in World War II. Six hundred million babies have been killed worldwide since 1980. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. One billion six hundred million babies have been killed via abortion since 1980. About 2,000 have been killed in the U.S. just today more than your hometown of Louisville. So I want to say that you're correct in that statement, as far as I can see, but you still got a lot of flack for it. How did you respond to that initial flack, and what do you feel about that statement you made now? Well, let's put that in context. 
That statement was made seven years ago, two days after uh, Governor Rauner signed taxpayer-funded abortion into law. That's that's the context. Every every time you see something and hear something, and there are a lot of things taken out of context in this because they could, because J.B. Pritzker could say it, he could make an ad about it, and he could slam it out there. And and you said he and I, you set a Republican and and a Democrat side by side and throw the Chicago Tribune in their face, and and they're going to crucify the Republican and 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 you know ask uh, the Democrat what his favorite flavor of cookies are. You know, I mean, it, it really that's the, that's that's it. Unless you're someone like Adam Kinzinger, and then they uh, that's a whole other story. OK, uh, but the reality is uh, we're speaking truth. And as I was up in Chicago, uh, as that began to get out, many people agreed that, uh, no, I understand what you're saying now. But then you, 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 we had many Jewish organizations that, that came out and said, boy, I don't know. I don't, why did you do that? It's just something you don't do. So, you know, I get it. I made my apologies. I said, OK, I, I'm sorry. I didn't think that I was offending you. I thought I was actually elevating understanding to the cause that this was a terrible atrocity behind, you know, there's really nothing compares to it, except in my opinion, you know, a billion babies being murdered over the last uh, uh, 60 years. So, uh, you know, that's one of the things I'm raw. I'm uncensored. I, I, I say things that need to be said, but uh, but I will admit sometimes I, I will back up and I say, OK, I, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have said that, but please understand the context of which I said it. So why why did you apologize exactly? Well, because why, the why Jews, was it so bad to compare the two? It offended the Jewish population, who are still under persecution in many parts of the world. And and I and I kind of I had to go back to because uh, you know, I'm pretty stubborn sometimes, and I'm like I'm I, I'm asking the same question that you just asked. I'm like you know what? And I don't just apologize to just to apologize, but I looked and I said, okay, with the persecution that still continues across the world with Jews, I get it. That's a sensitive uh, that's a sensitive statement. And and now I know, and I, and I appreciate that because uh, I support Israel. Uh, I will always support Israel and uh, been to Israel twice. So, uh, you know, that was something that was uh, that's something that I learned Mm -hmm. out of the process. Right. How would what would you have done with abortion in Illinois? We're one of the most pro-choice states, if not tied for first and most pro-choice states. What would you have done to maybe limit the number, lower the number of abortions annually? So first and foremost, automatically, first day agenda, I was going to fight to to do away with taxpayer-funded abortion. I mean, Illinois is going to be the abortion mecca of the United States. Already, uh, abortion clinics are being put up all around the border towns. Anywhere there's a bridge, you will, you are, there is right now, and please, if there's someone listening out there that, that hears this message that lives in one of those communities across the state lines, uh, go check with your city council, because if you see a new clinic, clinic, a medical facility being built, it very well could be an abortion facility under disguise. That's how they do this. They come in and, 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 and ask for a medical facility license. They build it, and then, bam, there goes the Planned Parenthood uh, sign. Governor Pritzker is uh, authorizing funding. Planned Parenthood is also funding buses, mobile mobile abortion units. So, uh, number one, I would have outlawed and, and made it illegal to, to for taxpayers to have to pay this. I would have imposed stricter restrictions on uh, – on some of these abortions, I mean, they're they're not safe, period, because they're not being checked as as as, as even a, an actual medical clinic in our communities are. And then ultimately, I would have worked to make well, and then I also would have did away with the um, uh, the parental right of notice, the fact that that children now can go get abortions without their their. You know, a school teacher can help a child get an abortion, and then after the fact inform the uh, parent. That's wrong. And then after that, I would have worked hard to make abortion unnecessary. I want to partner with churches, uh, civic organizations, religious organizations to make sure that women have true choices and options. Uh, And right now they don't have. They are being steered in one direction. So I think that we have a lot of work to do there. And I and I, I still look forward to the day that Illinois can be a beacon in that aspect. The natural question that a lot of people on the left are going to ask you right now is, what about rape and incest? Do you believe that women have a constitutional, a human right to do away with their pregnancy, which is what you and I would call kill their baby if it is still inside of them? Even then, that's not even, you know, that's up for debate. But 
what about rape and incest? What do you think? I believe life starts at conception, and I support uh, life. So, so no, I uh, took a lot of heat over that. I have no exceptions, and you know, except for the life of the mother, which in that case, I don't consider that an abortion. Obviously, if you have a DNC, if something happened outside of the mother's control and her life is threatened, I, I totally I, I understand that. So, uh, so no, I have. No exceptions. Uh, definitely took a lot of heat over that, but I have to stand on what I believe personally. Uh, does that mean that you know I'm going to stand up as governor and try to impose that on everyone else? That's what a lot of people don't really realize and really truly get is that we have a general assembly. And under J.B. Pritzker's rule, he has pretty well had, for the most part, you know, a, a, a iron-fisted rule over what he wants. If he wants it, he has the money, he seems to get it. But at the end of the day, it is the general assembly that – you know, creates and passes laws that change things such as that. Speaking of laws, I have a big question. I'm going to have to read straight from this paper from uh, in order to get this across to you. But more than 180 new laws are set to take effect in Illinois on January 1st, 2023. The most well-known being those included in the Safe T Act, a massive criminal justice reform package updating rules governing jail time and the use of police force. And the greatest controversy of the Safety Act is the ending of cash bail, which advocates say caused poor people to just sit in jail because they can't pay bail, even on minor charges, while richer people can pay for their pretrial release, even for more serious crimes. The Safety Act also requires that all Illinois police officers wear body cams by 2025 and requires more law enforcement training, among many other things. And you were shaking your head just a moment ago. I just want people... The cameras on me, but uh, but because of concerns such as the notion that some dangerous criminals could be released, Democrats recently amended, which for those of you who don't know means made changes to the bill, and have now extended the list of detainable offenses and made it so that those charged with crimes before January first would be able to remain on the old cash bail system among some other changes. The fact that there are major changes being made to this bill, though, in the name of protecting the public, makes many, understandably so, believe that the bill put the public at risk in the first place. All this said, Darren, what do you make of the Safety Act? The public is still in grave danger. The discretion of the judges is severely limited, and that has not been changed. The judges now, so the judges take care of bail. They, the judges make the make the rule or the law on on make the rule on on what they uh, you know are going to put someone up as bail. J. B. Pritzker gave a story during this about a young woman who who stole the diapers and sat in jail for I think uh, three weeks. That's an absolute lie. It never happened. Under the law, it can't happen. Worst, absolutely worst case scenario under the law, the state of Illinois, uh, that mother could have only uh, been in jail for three days. Absolute worst scenario. There is no judge that is going to hold the mother of a baby if she's still in diapers, if she needs them in jail at all. He made the story up, and that's the kind of nonsense we're putting up with. So, you know, yesterday, a Chicago police officer uh, took their life. Uh, earlier this week, two Chicago police officers took their life. Last week, two other Chicago police officers took their life. This is taking place around the state, and it's not being reported. On January 1st, if this law, is, apparently it's set to go into effect, which let's let's I want to remind everyone— Two years ago, in lame duck session after after the election, uh, this law was passed. It has been setting for two years, and probably would would have went into effect without being known if it weren't for the gubernatorial elections and I and others raising the alarm and letting people know what's going on. And uh, by the way, when we go back into lame duck session from January fourth to January tenth, uh, take a look at House Bill five eight five five. We've been claiming for years. They're coming after our guns. They're coming after our guns. There are bans on certain guns. There are bans that making it illegal uh, for for certain uh, magazines and clips. Uh, This is how things are done uh, with the Democrats in control in Springfield. Hmm. They're done quietly in secret. 
they're done quietly in secret and over at, and at night without any participation of, of the true stakeholders. Uh, no Republicans involved, no state's attorneys, no uh, no police. Uh, they have their agenda and, and they're carrying that out. And by the way, just just wait till you watch your papers. And in some cases, you can watch uh, some of my some of the articles that I share. Uh, there there are articles out there that are already letting people know uh, what what. Uh, criminals are going to be let out of jail on January 1st. There, there, there is an actual, there will be people uh, coming out, dangerous criminals that should be held, that will no longer be held. For people that might not know government and how the state of Illinois works as in-depth as you do, can you explain exactly and paint the picture very, very clearly, maybe even a fifth grader could understand this, why or what exactly about how these bills get passed is so interesting or almost criminal or secretive or or misleading or what's so bad about how they're passed so here in the united states we we when we have a national election we've heard of the electoral college and the electoral college was put in place by our founding fathers to make sure that any one state any two theoretically new york illinois and and california could elect whatever you know national figures that they wanted to but the electoral college kind of waters that down and and makes sure that the 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 people out there who maybe aren't necessarily getting represented represented ha, have a voice States don't have that. States do not have that process. So when we've got a, you know, when we've got a Cook County, and for some reason why people with liberal mindsets are, you know, moved to the cities, I, I that I can't really grasp or understand. But states don't have that. So you've got, uh, you know, the population determines the number of, of representatives and, and legislators. And here in Illinois, when I got elected in 2019 as a new state representative and, and with Governor Pritzker, I came in the first time ever in the super minority, meaning that we don't even have to show up. They've got so many Democrats on the other side of the aisle who show up and pass these laws. They don't need us. And as a matter of fact, uh, this recent election, that number got even worse. So so these uh, people show up in committee meetings. They have their own committee meetings and their caucuses, and they determine and they write these laws. And no one, you, people assume and you hear about what they're writing, but you don't know it because because it's not a bill. And then when they come out, they will make an amendment. They will take a sitting bill and, and erase it. It's called the shell bill and insert new language. And typically there's a process. If I write a bill today and I've got this idea, uh, and, and well, I doubled fines at one point in time on, on, on passing a school bus, you know, if it was mm-hmm. letting out children. So I, I, I wrote the bill. It, it had a hearing. It was it was read. The people knew about it. It sets for a while. It goes to committee. It sets for a while. There's a process. But when you have uh, some of these situations where they they have changed the rules uh, that they can fast track it. So literally, if we are in session, uh, they could drop something uh, that morning. And and if they if they amend a bill and they can totally you know gut and replace it, uh, the other side of the aisle has one hour to look at it before it's brought to the floor and voted on. That's how does that happen? That sounds when you're insane. in the super majority. It, when you're in power, that's what I found out very quickly. I I was uh, serving on a school board for 17 years. I I literally back in 1995, and I was I was on the uh, I was on our FFA parliamentary procedure uh, team. So uh, for some silly reason, I'm not an avid book reader other than the Word of God. But I read Robert's Rules of Orders. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, man, I can't wait to get to Springfield because I'm really going to kind of help change it, put a stop to some of this stuff. But when I arrived in Springfield, I was given a 92-page book in the House, and it's called The Rules of the House. And uh, so the House has their own rules. They're supposed to abide by the Roberts Rules of Orders, but their rules you know, uh, are, are precedent. And at the end of every paragraph, you are reminded that the party in control makes the rules. So they, they can literally change the rule in the process of a debate. We have literally been debating on the floor and stood up and, and called for a point of order. And uh, the, the chair has the option to 
no, we're going to disregard that rule right now and move on. That has happened many times. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. It's dangerous for a constitutional republic. And that is the sound. That is the cry. That is the alarm that we better pay attention and start getting these people out of office and electing men and women with backbone and, and, and who, have, who have a mindset to do the right thing or we're going to lose this thing. Huh. So the supermajority can change the rules while the game is being played. <laughs> yes, and they do it often. Is that in the Illinois Constitution? <laughs> they that do that's it allowed? often in, in the rules. And see, the, each, the House and the Senate uh. pass the rules. And, uh, and then, it, yes, it allows that. So, How strange. Does this happen in other states at the same uh, level of I severity? I don't know about that. I do not know about that. So, no, you can, people, I, I beg people, go to ILGA.gov and watch the process. So January 4th, when we go back into session, uh, I beg people, if, if you've got time, I know everybody's working, but click on ILGA.gov and you can literally watch committee hearings. You can watch the debate on the floor. You will see this firsthand, and I'll be talking about it, you know, on my Facebook. I'll be sharing this to Facebook. People be sure and tune in or or I'll come off the floor immediately after and tell people this is what happened. It's ridiculous. It's sickening. Well, I tell you what, there's a lot of value in you being able to explain that so coherently for people like well, me I to hope understand. that's what it is. So. Yes. Well, because we don't really know. We just hear there's corruption going on at the state, at the Capitol, uh, but we don't really know how or why. But you're explaining it in language that someone like me can understand and presumably 99% of my audience can understand. And I really appreciate that. Moving on to a completely different subject, I have to ask about this. The former president, Donald J. Trump, has made it known that he believes that the 2020 presidential election was rigged. And again, sorry, I apologize to everyone. I'm really just switching with no transition, but we only have so much time, you know. He believes that the 2020 presidential election was rigged. To put it clearly, he and many Republicans believe that there were thousands or more of Trump ballots that were not counted or were destroyed due to everything from rigged voting machines to biased election observers to fraudulent ballots and corrupt mail-in voting systems and processes, all implemented to assure President Joe Biden's victory. Darren, I mean, you know President Trump, he endorsed you. Do you believe that the 2020 presidential election was rigged or not? Well, and this is where I go back and talk about failed Republican leadership and process. Because didn't we just witness the same thing happen in Maricopa County? Didn't we just witness the same thing happen in Georgia as happened before? Why, after two years, wasn't the process fixed? It wasn't. So I don't know if it's so much uh, you, you've never heard me say that it was rigged or it was stolen. I say we gave it away. We allowed it to be taken from our hands. I've been saying that, and after this recent election, when I see the exact, the exact same outcome in Maricopa County, Arizona, the same group of people, nothing's been done since 2020, nothing's being done now. Failed Republican leadership who should have, who should have got together and made sure that this didn't happen, and they didn't, and it continues to happen. So that's why that's probably my biggest argument for pressing in. We, the, the same stuff is taking place in uh, uh, in uh, in Chicago and Cook County. But when I take a look at it, it's because we don't have people. Our Republican leaders aren't putting people there to monitor the system. It can all be monitored through poll watchers and election judges, and there's no support for those people to show up. We 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 had a lot of amazing. David Paul Blumenshine and 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 and, and uh, Bloomington here is our uh, and, and his wife Tanya, you know, our election integrity specialist, and um, we we fought and we tried, but you know, when you don't have the support to to do what you need to do, is sometimes you're handicapped, and and when the Republican Party doesn't join forces with you to press in and push on to this as as a whole, as a whole. Uh, there are little pockets where people were trying to do, and, you know, it takes money as well. So uh, I'm going to say we, we, we're allowing it to be taken from us. And when you say that, and just to put it clearly, do you believe that the presidential election of 2020, that there was any dishonest reporting 
of votes. Well, there's dishonest reporting. Yes, it's that's taking place right now. Where you know that's being challenged. Deanna Mazaki's uh, uh, a, a state representative race up in DuPage County. Uh, she's challenging it. That the, the race has already been called. I don't think anything's going to be overturned. But yes, there. Uh, I just talked to a gentleman today. They're still going through signature counting signatures, and and yes, there is definite fraud involved. There was definite fraud in some of these uh, precincts where people would go in and and they didn't even have Republican ballots, you know, so people had to wait for an hour before they went and got a Republican ballot, and sometimes the people left. So, no, mm. there's definite, there's definitely a, a, a problem. But, again, until we, the people, stand up and say enough and start electing Republicans and start demanding a, a voter ID and, and stop some of this nonsense, I'm gonna tell, I'm, I want to make a statement right now, and I want to be very clear about it. We must vote early the next election coming up. If Republicans mm. don't like that because they, you know, they believe that uh, that's that's a ballot harvesting and it's wrong. It, guess what? It's legal. There's a legal process and the Democrats are doing that. They're insured. They know when they have enough votes. J.B. Pritzker knew. I didn't know this then. I know it now. He knew three weeks after early voting that he had enough votes to win. Mm-hmm. And that is uh, that is something until we win elections, uh, we're not going to be part of the process. Mm-hmm. Do you think if you would have gone back, uh, if you could go back in time, you would have encouraged your voters to do early voting more? Oh, I did. I did. I couldn't get the money out of our campaign. I spent three hundred thousand uh, dollars sending out mailings, uh, alerting people. I needed two million dollars to do that. We didn't have it. Couldn't get it. Uh, so no, I we did every one of our every one of our bus stops. I was telling people vote now. When it was soon as early voting started, vote early. If you can't make it to the polls for some reason, request a mail in ballot. Get your vote in. It is. Matter of fact, I uh, to, to some extent, I believe it's safer and secure than the voting on election day. Mm, mm, interesting point. That's a quotable thing you just said. As I said before, Donald J. Trump, the former president of the United States, endorsed you not too long ago. You shook his hand. You're on stage with him. What do you make of the former president, Donald J. Trump? What are your thoughts on him, both as a man and a president, and perhaps even a friend. Well, I'm going to say that the three times that I've been blessed to have a conversation with him, uh, I've been in the presence of a very humble, genuine leader. Um, when I look back and see, uh, you know, <laughs> just everything that he, he under his governance, uh, our, our, our border crisis, our economy, uh, life was good. There is no one, absolutely no one that can deny that uh, under his four years of presidency, Life was good, and America was great for for a bit again, and that has all been taken away now. We are just – I see us in shambles. So, uh, no, I uh, I support President Trump. Mm-hmm. And you like – would you call him a friend even? I would. That's kind of cool. No, <laughs> hey, I, I, well, I'm blessed. And I, that only <laughs> happened – no, I, I certainly would. Mm-hmm. Well, he's a very humble – genuine man that puts his family first and all of this not all of this nonsense of his past uh, has just been, in my opinion it's been it's been grossly distorted and if I would have one word of advice for him uh, especially towards the end of the 2020 election I would have said hey cool your jets on the tweets and, and just leave that alone and do your you know do your job but uh, uh, he does what he does for a very specific purpose and and uh, that's that's his doings mm-hmm. Something you briefly touched on a little earlier was gun control. You said, look at uh, what was the name of the bill again? Someone HB asked about 5855. This. Okay. What do you think about gun control? Just put it out there very plainly. I know you have multiple times, but what yeah. do you think about gun control? Do we need more of it? What are your thoughts on the Foyd card? Tell me everything you believe about guns in the state of Illinois. Okay. So I believe and I stand by the Second Amendment exactly as it is written. Our rights to bear arms shall not be infringed. And when you do the check on the additional verbiage, you find out that that is uh, infringed, uh, that, that we are allowed this right to protect ourselves from tyrannical governments, the exact same reason that we became into existence against the, the English monarchy. Guns are not the problem. The city of Chicago has the strictest gun laws in the nation. The state of Illinois now has the strictest gun laws in the nation. Uh, we are doing absolutely nothing to uh, to 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 uh, deal with the people who are creating these egregious crimes. And interestingly enough, almost every time, every time one of these crimes are committed, we go back and we see a past from from the criminal. 
that was ignored. It was ignored by the family. It was ignored by the school. It was ignored by the church. It was ignored sometimes by law enforcement. But a lot of people don't realize this. We have the uh, Firearm Restraining Safety Act out there that J.B. Pritzker signed into law. There is an actual process that should be taking place in our families, our schools, and our, our churches, and our communities, and our businesses, and, and, our, and our law enforcement to identify these people. J.B. Pritzker's not saying anything about that. That law was signed in, that bill was signed into law, I think, right at two years ago. And we hear nothing about that. Many times when you talk about someone needing, um, needing counseling or mental health, people don't know where to go. But Governor Pritzker has expanded and increased uh, exp- uh, spending on mental health the last few years. But guess what? No one knows where to go to get help. So uh, that's our true problem is getting people help, helping them understand uh, where they go, helping them get there, being there by their side through this process. And, uh, you know, absolutely, when you when you when you are deemed a threat or you you do something wrong, you know, you're going to lose your rights for a while. There's no doubt about that. The FOID card serves no point. We have the background uh, firearm check, the federal firearm check. That's all we need. That's all any other state has. Every other state in the union, I think there's only two other that have anything in resemblance to a FOID card. The FOID card is a money grab, and a lot of people forget this. Two years ago, the $20 million was setting in the FOID collected that was supposed to be helping state police. You know, if they needed additional people for the FOID, that fund was swept. J.B. Pritzker's administration swept that, and they diverted that money elsewhere. Hmm. Well, what's the worst, though, that can happen if we do take away guns in the state of Illinois or at least severely restrict them? Say, yeah, no one can have guns, period, just law enforcement. What's the worst that could happen? The worst that can happen is probably a a replication of what happened about 250 years ago. If people have the backbone to stand up and say, I'm not putting up with this. Hmm. And just tell people what what does that mean exactly well i think that means if uh, you know it will be a tyrannical government that would attempt to take uh, our firearms and and unfortunately our schools are no longer teaching the history of what that looked like in the past our schools have taken that out but uh, and that's why many people are starting to pull their children out of public school and homeschool them and many homeschool curriculums do continue to talk about uh, these tyrannical actions that governments have taken in the past to limit people's rights and freedoms and talk about how those people then stood up and pushed back and said absolutely not and uh, I will be one of those people to stand up and say absolutely not Right. Certainly, history will teach us and tells us very clearly the first thing that you should do if you're trying to take over a people and be a tyrannical government is disarm the people. We're getting close on time here, so I want to respect your time. I know you got some dinner reservations here in a little bit. Maybe one of the things I want to ask about, uh, first of all, a patron asked, you know, you're a farmer. What do you make of the wind and solar farms sprouting up in central and southern Illinois? So I have no problem with renewable energy. I understand that someday, you know, we we, we could, uh, you know, run out of oil. Or run, I, I get that, uh, but the reality is the technology is not there uh, to 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 replace coal and and oil. It's not there, and 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 I've even got some proof of that. Uh, the 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 energy bill that was passed one year ago. Everyone listening. Have your utility bills gone up or have they gone down? And I'm going to say that everyone listening, your utility bills have doubled. They have doubled because coal-fired reliable energy plants are being pushed out of business. Carbon taxes on coal. We can't even mine our coal here in Illinois and ship it overseas. And oh, by the way, China's setting on an order right now of building over 1,500 power plants to make up for a lot of the manufacturing that uh, you know we're sending over there to them. And and no one wants to talk about the fact the when you see the emissions coming out of a coal-fired plant, take the one in Springfield, Illinois, or many places around here, that is not smoke. That's steam. That large structure is called a scrubber, and that steam coming out of there is 95% clean. And a lot of people don't see that. They see that smoke, or the, you know, the steam coming out, and they, they, they think that's smoke, and it's polluting our atmosphere. It's not. And as a farmer, uh, I'm going to contend that I'm, one, I'm concerned about the environment as, as surely as much real reality-wise as anyone, because I want my children and grandchildren to be able to continue to, you know, uh, function uh, on the farm and we need the environment there. So uh, the batteries, and no, no one wants to talk about the mining that's taking place in other countries for the lithium under slave labor, under, under Chinese rule, and, 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 and gosh, 
just Google a lithium mine and take a look at the destruction that that's doing to the open face of the earth. Now, you know, we're not hearing anything about that. So have no problem with renewable energy, uh, but I believe we should ease ourselves into it. Instead, J.B. Pritzker has said, you know, in 10 years, there's not going to be any coal-fired electricity in the state of Illinois. In 20 years, there's not going to be any natural gas. And then up to possibly 50 years, uh, he intends on, on this bill that was signed to do away with nuclear energy. That is dangerous. Again, why would any business want to come to the state of Illinois because of that? I suppose the last question I want to ask you is going to have something to do with energy. Someone commented this on Facebook and wanted me to ask you this, and the comment got a good few likes. I didn't know how big of a deal it was until now you're talking about nuclear a little bit, but in 2021, the Byron and Dresden nuclear power plants were set to close unless, of course, the General Assembly, a.k.a. the legislature, a.k.a. the House of Representatives and the Senate, uh, of which you were a senator in, Unless they could pass a bill that would keep the Byron and Dresden stations open and save the jobs of a thousand Illinoisans, uh, they were going to close and those jobs would be gone. When that very bill to save the plants was finally put to a vote, you chose to vote no, not only once, but twice. And this is according to one of the nuclear power workers. This left many nuclear workers feeling betrayed because you had come to their group before the vote and said that I support you 100 percent. So the question is, why did you vote to essentially close those plants after supporting nuclear workers that day in Springfield? And what is your true stance on the nuclear power plants in the state of Illinois? I've tried to get that message out. And to my friends that are listening right now, uh, I have a question uh, or I have a comment for you. Your jobs were never at stake. That was all about a $700 million bailout for ComEd period. No one in their right mind would shut down nuclear, and I believe we need more nuclear. Nuclear is one of the the, the cost, uh, the, the, the most cleanest environmentally uh, uh, um, oh, what's the word? Uh, uh, you know, uh, Certainly one of the cleanest forms of energy. Well, clean, reliable, that's the word. Reliable. I <laughs> I had a hiccup there. Um, so no, the, you, you were being duped by your state representatives and your state legislators, your senators that voted for that. That was a bailout. Remember at the beginning of the show, I talked about uh, how these lobbyists come in your offices and make deals. That's all that was. So my question then is, why is energy twice as what it was before that bill was signed? That's the problem. In nuclear, it was never on the chopping block. It's impossible. They, the nuclear plants that produce more than uh, uh, you know half of the energy that Illinois uses. And and if you think back to about five years ago, you went through the same argument. Five years before that, I'm going to tell you what. Five years from now, the nuclear jobs are going to be on the chopping block again because that's what these government officials do. They make this false threat, this false accusation, and oh my gosh, they create the problem that they have a solution to. And and they push this problem out and they tell everybody, do you want this to be like this? And and that's exactly what our energy grid is going through. And that is exactly what uh, the nuclear workers know that. They went through this exact same thing five years ago. So unfortunately, um, unfortunately they, 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 they fell for a lie. That's that's mm. all there is to it. So uh, and, and the proof of that is that our energy bills are twice as what they were today than they were then and the reality is you're going to see it again in a few more years it always comes around fascinating and it always comes around because of the negligence of comed i don't take any comed donations or support but they're out there the comed scandal with mike madigan comed is a uh, uh, being terribly mismanaged and because of that about every five or six years they need a bailout so then we have an energy bill and that's that's the uh, that, that's why this is all happening Understood. Well, there you have it, angry <laughs> nuclear workers. Hey, I'm. We, we, you know, we've got to have energy. We've got to have reliable energy, and without that, Illinois can't attract business. But uh, no, that was uh, that. That along with the gas tax hike uh, and and you know the the full term abortion bill. Uh, uh, well, uh, where do you stop the Safety Act? On and on and on. <laughs> that is definitely in the uh, top ten of the most uh, destructive bills out there. There were more ways to fix that and deal with that than just pass this tax increase. Darren Bailey, you're a busy man. you got to get going here soon. What's next for you, and are you going to run again? 
I'm going to leave that up to uh, to God. Uh, we're going to pray for wisdom and direction. We're going to stay out there. We're not going anywhere. We're continuing to fight for Illinois, and we will see what options and opportunities. I am I'm I'm all in, but to sit here and to suggest that hey, I'm the guy. I'm going to do this again until we win. I don't do that. I'm going to continue to uh, uh, represent the people as best I can with my voice and and my platform. And we're going to continue to educate and hopefully to unify people to bring them together so that together. Together, uh, we can decide what our options and what our solutions are for the future. Darren, you're a good man. You're an honest man. You're a smart man. You're a man of God. That's for sure. I sincerely appreciate your time today, and I hope this conversation. You know, we talked a lot about Governor J.B. Pritzker. The goal is, you know, I have a, I've had some of his friends on the show. I want to have him on. He can defend yep. himself a little bit, and right. people can get a great conversation with him. So, J.B., if you're hearing about this from one of your uh, one of your workers or anything, let's have you on as well. But Darren, again, you're a good man. Thank you so much for your time today. God bless you, Paul, and thanks for what you do. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Paul Garcia Show. If you'd like to support the show, check out our sponsors, like us on Facebook, follow us on Facebook, subscribe on YouTube, and subscribe on the podcast platforms. Another great way to support the show is simply by commenting on this video, sharing it, and dropping a like. Until next episode, God bless and have a great week.